Hey, what's the deal, YouTube? It's your girl, Miss Honey. Welcome back to the channel, you guys. It is your girl, Miss Honey, here for a Queen Sugar review. Um, All snuggled up, <laughs> ready for bed. Uh, tonight's episode, um, was interesting, interesting. You guys tell me if you agree, put it down below, but it was interesting. And I can see kind of how... Um, the setup is, it's almost like each of our characters separately are, you know, put in these little glass cubes, right? And we're all outside of the glass cubes and we can hear and see what's going on. Um, with Nova and Calvin inside of their glass cube and Micah and Charlie inside of their glass cube and Ralph Angel and Blue and Darla when they're all together inside of their glass cube um, and Vi and Hollywood inside of their glass cube and then we have um outside entities that are coming into the glass cubes um and we have our favorite characters who have to venture outside of their glass cubes and still navigate the world mid covid and this episode i think is called late april early may i don't know i can't i can't with these titles but, um, I don't know. I just kind of, just as I was getting to this place where I, I felt like things were kind of forced, um, I don't know. I came to this realization and I hope that I'm able to articulate what my feelings were about this episode of Queen Sugar accurately, um, Everything that we know and love about Queen Sugar is still the same. The the beauty, the textures, the tones, the, the set designs, the uh, the uh you know, the um it's not costuming, but you know what I mean. Their their clothes, their hair, you know, just everything that we have grown to know and love the beautiful bodies, you know, black bodies. Um, we've, we've grown, we've come to know and love about Queen Sugar is still present, but there is this palpable sense of dead air, um, stagnant energy that seems to bounce off the walls of, the glass cubes and it's kind of just ricocheting around. Like I hope I'm making sense. It's just kind of ricocheting around and going nowhere. You know what I mean? It's like playing racquetball, um, you know, just throwing it against the wall and <laughs> dodging the, uh, the rubber ball that's moving at a high rate of speed. Like, you know, because they're having to film in this way and because all of the um all of the beauty and the texture and the energy that we're we're used to seeing being spread amongst the parish and you know, in and out of storylines, we're not getting that. We're still getting beauty, but that just that all of that wonderful energy is just compressed now. And um, this episode was the first episode where I could feel that 
sense of of depression of um hopelessness of you know just being unsure uncertainty um desperate all of those feelings that i i've reconciled for myself and have moved been able to move past um praise god I, I felt confronted by it here and i felt it was it wasn't e e escapable because <laughs> was in these glass boxes, you know, it was in these glass boxes. And then I just got to this place where I got it. Like I got what I was supposed to get from this episode. I got what I think um, Ava and her team were trying to convey, right? So we'll first get the easiest over with, which was Nova and Calvin. Um, we come in on Nova and Calvin, and um, we're seeing a lot of scenes where Calvin is being really presented to us in this very palpable way um, as earnest and... Um, concerned and empathetic and compassionate and in love and thoughtful and you know um he's making breakfast and dropping bombs basically his daughter um's college is being uh closed down because of the pandemic and she wants to quarantine with he and nova as opposed to going home to her mom's house and he wants that too. He want he's he's felt uh separation from his daughter. Evidently there's some strained issues there and uh he wants her to come because he wants to reconnect with her. And honestly um I don't know that he would be able to do that outside of Nova. I mean, Nova's whole personality and whole, her, her whole energy energy is really one of a healer. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's the perfect place for he and his daughter to reconnect. Nova is, you know, Nova's keeps, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so... I was a little, I don't know. <clears throat> this is one of those scenes where I kind of felt like it, it, the whole Nova and Calvin thing seems forced to me. And maybe it's because they're required to have a, this immeasurable amount of, of, of dialogue because they're not going out and interacting with others or sitting in restaurants and at bars and, you know, having these moments and these scenes that we've seen in past seasons, right? I don't know. Nova goes immediately into this place where she, you know, expresses her concerns. It's a little bit of paranoia, I guess. It's concern, yeah. I, maybe it was some of it was anxiety, um, she felt like, um, is the, is the mom sending the daughter there to spy on her, um, you know, to pee in her soup, <laughs> you know, go through her things. I think it's, you know, I don't know. I, I, a part of me just feels like Nova, Nova, this is what it is, dude. Like, not that you wouldn't have to worry about your black boyfriend's black daughter coming and going through your things or spying on you for her mom. Like, I don't know. It's a weird it's a weird, it, like, I, I can relate 
at the same time, I just wonder if she would have these same concerns if the daughter was black. And then she goes on to talk about how um, his ex-wife, you know, got very racist with her. And, you know, what if the daughter is just like that? And um, he kind of reassures her that her da his daughter isn't like that and that she's very grounded. She's very down to earth and it'll be fine. And, you know, she she does come to this place where she says, you know, if if you need your daughter to come here, then that's fine. I mean, I guess I just have to, you know, suck it up and deal with it, right? And... I don't know. I think I later on we see where um, the daughter's gone out. I mean, so the daughter comes. The daughter comes and they play. Uh, she greets Nova. She's very lovely uh, seeming. They play cards. And, you know, she and Nova kind of build this, build start building their relationship with this whole um, women against the men type camaraderie. And then later on, the daughter expresses that her dad is really, really different now that he's with Nova. He seems truly happy now that he's with Nova and content and just a lot calmer. And Nova doesn't toot her own horn. She says, he's very happy that you're here and he's very excited about you guys getting closer, right? Like I said, Nova's Nova's a healer, you know, and... um. She's very communal and um, like I said, it's a lovely moment and she reaches up and she touches the daughter's hand and grabs the hand and Calvin's in the kitchen cleaning the dishes and he looks out and he sees her, you know, and the daughter embracing hands and and he just, just does his heart good. So later on when the daughter goes out for a run and he wants a little nookie nookie time, um, they end up, you know, in this conversation where Nova expresses that she's afraid um, of what is going to happen after um, COVID is over and they go out into the real world. And, and it's just, I realize now that maybe she has this really heightened sense of awareness about the difference in their color, the difference in their culture, the difference in their lifestyle, uh, maybe the difference even in their children, um, how the children were reared, just all of these things. Like maybe it's really, really at the bubbling at the top of the surface because she did have this extremely awkward, uncomfortable um, moment with his ex-wife. And because it's something that she keeps regurgitating, you know what I mean? Um, but at the same time, I have difficulty with Nova having these feelings. I have difficulty with Nova, you know, giving us this sort of naivete about what it is being in a mixed relationship. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think I'm just not buying it. I think that's what it is. I feel like I'm just not buying this whole tenacious, anxious situation slash loving kind. It's, 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 it has, it's not giving me what I need. I don't know. You guys, I, please help me, please. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I'm just like Nova. You with a white dude, girl, quit acting like you. Y'all was going out. Y'all was at bars dancing, all hugged up. He had to fight a fight his own coworkers about calling you being inappropriate with you and borderline racist. I mean, what you're an activist? Like what? What is? What are we doing here? What are we doing? 
it just, it feels, I don't know. Is she just keep trying to give him an out? I don't know. I spent too much time on this. You guys, you guys, please help me. I'm begging you, help me. So that's, that's the whole Nova Calvin situation. Oh, Lord. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, Charlie and Micah. Um, they're both negative. They're both at the house. And I think I figured out what's going on with, with, with the way I'm viewing Micah. But we're going to talk about it. Um, they're trying to make the best of quarantining. Um, later on, uh, in a discussion, we learned that Micah, that um, Charlie was a teen mom basically or a young mom like it was first year of college when she discovered she was pregnant with him and um you know par for the course we got we come full circle and learned that charlie sucked it up and made her way through school and did what she had to do um the best moment between it, it inside the uh charlie micah box is this conversation that she shares that she had with her dad. And when she went to tell him that she was pregnant, this Papa board alone. And he said to her, I'm not going to get emotional. Y'all know I'm a daddy's girl. He says to her, I, I, I was proud of you and I loved you yesterday. I'm proud of you and I love you today. And I'll be proud of you and I'll love you tomorrow. And I was just like, you better... From the grave, Ernest still gets your girl, Miss Honey, right here. Right here. Oh, daddies. Daddies. Daddies are so important. Daddies are so important. She just talks about how it motivated her and it just encouraged her to just keep pushing and doing her best. You know, we all know Charlie is... is um sharp as a tack and, 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 you know, very clever girl. This whole time she's going through boxes and paperwork, trying bylaws for the parish. And Micah is helping her to do that. She's trying to take, make the best of this downtime because she knows the light of day is going to come and Parker's going to be back and she's got to be ready to fight Parker and the Landry's. Okay. And she wants to be ready. She wants to make sure that she's got all her ducks in a row, um, as dotted and T's cross, which is the Charlie that we love, right? It's the Charlie that we love. And I think I was telling Pacino last week in the comments that, I love investigative Charlie. I love it when Charlie it gets 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 that little taste of something, a little whiff of something, and she follows her nose and she follows her suspicion and she, you know, tears down <laughs> the institution. <laughs> I love it when she goes to war with the firm, right? <clears throat> Anywho, um, so, uh, she's going through paperwork, looking at paperwork and Micah's phone is next to her and it rings and it's one of those auto messages, text messages, I guess it popped up and it had, um, party in the background and they were telling him to come on, you know what I'm saying? He was helping and being cool and everything. And then he was going to say he was going out for a drive and then he was going to stop by old Amber's house. Amber is the girl that he talking to now that he rebounded from Kiki with and, uh, and also is enamored with Charlie. Right. And, um, Michael, I mean, uh, Michael sees her with his phone and he was like, what are you doing? Why are you looking at my phone? Like, that's not cool. That's not cool. And then his dialogue from here on out within this argument is I'm grown. I'm grown now. I'm grown. Okay, Michael. <laughs> okay. I, we we all hear you. What else? I was just going to go for a ride. I'm grown. I'm an adult. I'm an adult. I'm an adult. I was like, oh, we got to get Michael some dialogue. We've got to get Michael some dialogue. The thing of it is, is that Michael was always an older individual, right? And they they were just keeping him, I think, skinny and shooting him small and 
um, keeping his hair a certain type of way and the backpacks and the book bags and all of this stuff. Um, you know, giving him this young guy appearance. And now we're seeing where the actor is allowed to let his beard grow in, his hair is coming in thicker. It's a much more mature cut. He's got, you know, big boy clothes on and um, this gold chain around his neck. And it's like, yeah, here I am as my, you know, 25, 26 year old self playing a young college guy, but it's just kind of trying to um, get us used to the fact that that Micah, that, that Micah, that teenage Micah done, gone, forget about it. Now we're, we're moving, we're, we're, we're warp speed into grown a man, Micah. <laughs> Plus we just keep telling you so you don't forget, right? Anyway, She's pissed off because he's trying to get out here in this world. And we're in the middle of a pandemic and may bring it back to her and endanger her. And he's being inconsiderate. And how could he? And yada, yada, yada. Like father, like son. It was a moment. It was a moment because in Charlie's mind, she thinks she and Micah are good friends. They have a good rapport. And... Their relationship isn't typical. She doesn't understand that like a lot of moms who um, started out as single moms and raised their kids, you know, up um, and tried to forge these close relationships with their children. It's a place where it is kind of it can the lines can get kind of blurred He's not your husband. He's not your man. He's your son. And he's going to grow up and he's going to have his own mind and his own opinion and he's going to make his own decisions. And you can no longer send him to his room. <laughs> As she comes to grips with this because she sees when she says like father, like son, she can see the hurt and pain. Um, she went too far. She went too far. She knows she went too far. Later on, she pours two glasses of wine, one for her and one for Micah. And she tells him the story about how she had the, you know, her first argument with his dad and how she sat his dad out after they argued. They went two semesters broken up until she apologized for, um, being in her feelings and going too far. And then she in turn apologizes to Micah for the same reason. And it was a good moment because although there was this moment of reconciliation between the two of them, understanding her understanding that she has to let him go and be an adult at the same time, he would be over in the, um, over in, in the in-law suite and every time he came into the big house into my part of the house he would have to have a mask on I would have to have a mask on like I mean you can't control him but you can control how his adulthood affects you you know what I mean all right um, and I think it was, it was good for her, you know, this reconciliation moment. And I think it was a good moment for us too, because, um, you know, it was helped me to kind of accept, you know, that Mike is a grown man. Now we've got the wine. We've, he's told us repeatedly, you know, got the change in look. And now he's coming alongside her and kind of partnering with her to go through all this research, get all the facts together and prepare for warfare with Parker and the Landry's. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, the toughest, I think, for us would be Hollywood and Vi. And um, we see where Hollywood's called Vi. Um, by the time he got to um, Baton Rouge to uh, see his mom, 
they had put her in the hospital and he was not allowed to see her. And um, there's this whole dialogue about how he just looked at the, the, you know, the wall of windows outside of the hospital from the parking lot and just pick one and, you know, thought to himself, that's where my mom is and just focused all his prayers on that one window. And, um, Vi just, just, you know, she wants to go and she wants to be with Hollywood, but Hollywood says, no, then I'm going to be worried about her. I'm going to be worried about you. I can't have that. I need you there where I know you're safe and sound, right? And Vi encourages him and, um, you know, just tries to speak as much peace and compassion and understanding as she knew how. And it was this moment where it kind of sounded like rhetoric and then there was kind of like this shift that I really accredit Tina Lifford, the the actress who plays Aunt Vi. I really credit her for this shift. There was this place where it was it was like um, it just didn't seem like rhetoric anymore. It just didn't seem like dialogue. It was this moment and this shifting in the energy where I could tell this was Tina Lifford. This was Tina Lifford saying what she would say to Hollywood if Hollywood was really her man. Or what she would say to me if I were to say, hey, I'm dealing with this yada, yada, yada. And, and it was a very real, authentic moment. And in speaking into Hollywood to encourage him, I felt like she was speaking into me about faith. I, I felt like, you know, this connection between that you have to have this clicking that happens, that has to happen in your spirit and in your mind when you have zero control over whether a, a loved one lives or dies. Like it's it's out of your hands at, at, at some point. And how you reconcile that um, really depends on what you believe about the spirit being absent from the body, right? And it's just this little speech. This It wasn't a speech. This little snippet of dialogue and encouragement really spoke to that and um I enjoyed it I enjoyed it tremendously because we get a lot of great one-liners from Tina Lifford and the Vi character um but this by far had had to be one of my favorite one of my favorite scenes between um and she's had a great many. She's had some really good dialogue moments with Charlie and Ralph Angel and Nova. But this moment, I think, um, spoke to Hollywood. It spoke to me. And I think it spoke to a whole body of people who are dealing with this constant turnover of death, right? And the loss of control. Um, Vi also invited Prosper to come over. It was an absolutely brilliant move. Um, second only to Nova, including um, distracting Prosper with, you know, a little help, you know, um, and needing a little help. And she says, hey, you're over there by yourself. You've you've not been out of the house. You haven't gone anywhere. I've been here. Hollywood's gone to see his mom. Come over here and visit with me and stay with me. Stay in one of my extra rooms and I'll cook for you. We can keep each other company, right? And Prosper doesn't fight. He doesn't fight. He says, okay, cool, I'll do it. Now, he's been quarantined this whole time, hasn't left the house. And so here's an opportunity for him to visit with people that he loves and and has great moments with and get some good cooking, right? <laughs> um you know, it's it was a brilliant brilliant move. Later on, um you know, Hollywood isn't there. All that love and all that kindness that she's given to Hollywood she knows she gets a chance to, to shower it on Prosper and he needs it. 
And I, you can see this moment where she decides she's going to tell him um, that earlier that morning, this is the next day, that earlier that morning that Hollywood's mom passed. And he had already, you know, walked us through the fact that she was, um, I can't remember if he said she was intubated, but she was on a ventilator and um, they were going to take her off the ventilator and then Vi gave him the encouragement where well, she passed on, right? And then we know now, we didn't know then that the ventilator was a no-no. You know, we were scrambling to get ventilators. We didn't know that the ventilator was actually pushing um, the virus deeper into the lungs. And once a person gets on a ventilator, it's nearly impossible to wean them off of it. Um, almost always fatally done. Like it's, there's people who survive, but we know now. And, um, she hates that she didn't go with Hollywood. And here's where she needs comfort from Prosper, but Prosper is so devastated. He took it really hard because she would be the fifth person um, in his age bracket that he knows has died. And um, I can remember almost um, to the word having this frustration in conversation with someone else about, you know, why us, meaning black people, I think think he meant black people, but I also think he meant the elderly, more importantly, um, to go like this, to be picked off like this and this way after fighting and yada, yada, yada. Like it was a very, very real moment. Very, very real moment. Again, the actor that plays Prosper, I think, did an excellent job like conveying over those feelings. It was palpable. It was real. I mean, the, the tears that welled in his eyes. And then Vi sits to the edge of the sofa. He's in the recliner. And she grabs his hand and she says, we're going to get through this. We're going to get through this. And... um. It was this it was this crazy moment, right? Like she couldn't be with Hollywood, which is the thing she would have immediately done barring COVID. But for her to be able to convey all of these things and have all of these emotions and these feelings and just to walk it out, even to show it out do for, you know, because she's a woman that serves. She's, it's almost like Prosper was standing in proxy for Hollywood, right? He was also standing in proxy for uh, representation for us of, you know, our mothers, our fathers, our grandfathers, our grandmothers who are going through this as well and expressing to us that frustration, right? Um, just the, just, it, it was just such a layered, layered scene, right? Like each one of the conversations, even though in the beginning it felt like glass boxes to me, um, I, I got something from it. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, um, Ralph Angel and um, Darla and Blue are continuing to maintain and live in as much happiness as they possibly can. Ralph Angel is just happy to be productive. And he's happy coming home and finding Blue there and finding Darla there. They're all... Um, educating themselves, edifying, uh, I'm sorry, enriching themselves and then bringing, you know, 
coming back together and bringing all of those moments to share with one another. You can really see a nice cohesive unit between all three of them. And you can see how um, everything kind of fits, right? Everything just fits. It just does. You know, it just, it fits. It just all looks lovely. At the same time, we're we're used to this this damaged relationship. I think I'm still picking around corners and turning the lights on and checking under the bed as it pertains to Ralph, Angel, and Darla. Um, but it's 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 good moments. Um, Ralph Angel is having this experience at work where he meets an older gentleman at work and the older gentleman lives there at the retirement center and his wife is in the memory care unit and memory care units are where they put people, um, where they house people who have dementia and Alzheimer's. It, um, they're not free to come and go in and out of the doors. And um, they have around the clock care, um, you know, and you have to go into the memory care unit to visit them. Well, this gentleman's been married to his wife for 57 years and she had to move into the facility. So he moved into an adjoining facility and Ralph Angel is doing um, janitorial work there and they have conversation and he talks about how much he loves his wife and everything and it, you know, gives Ralph Angel this um, heart flutter. He goes home and Darla's frustrated about something. What? I don't know because my sister was calling me on the phone, but I do see him scoop her down off the counter in the middle of her frustration and hug her up and love her up and comfort her and let her know that she's not alone through it all. Later on, um, he goes and he sees the same older gentleman and he learns that it's his birthday and that because of the pandemic, um, his wife can't come visit him and he can't come visit her on his birthday. And he is lamenting. He is, you know, just questioning everything. You know, he's, he's, he's upset about it. He's down, he's frustrated and he's, what's it all about? You know what I mean? <laughs> and, um, Ross says, well, Hey, I, I'll celebrate your birthday with you. I'll, you know, I'll do my best to make you feel better. And, you know, he's just like, you You know what, that's so thoughtful of you, I appreciate it. He said, you know, he'd made a comment when he met him about, you know, what a great name he had, Ralph Angel. And he says, you know what, I like your name, but I think I'm going to call you Good Hearted. And I thought, ooh, we changed my name. Ooh, <laughs> he said Good Hearted. It was just something about it that connected with Ralph Angel, right? So Ralph Angel had put together this um, moment for this gentleman where he was able to bring the wife out of memory care to the outside window of this gentleman's room. And the gentleman was able to see his wife on his birthday and, you know, at least touch through, you know, on the glass and see her and they could hear each other. And it was the guy just really appreciated uh, what Ralph Angel did. And so then Ralph Angel goes home and, um, at the same time, these montages were playing, uh, side by side and it was emotional because it was um, on one side Hollywood coming home to his mama's house and going through some some pictures and memory books and seeing that she had kept all of his postcards from when he was on the rig. Okay. <laughs> and um, she kept all that stuff and... And uh, he was just reading the things he was saying about how much he loved her. 
And I think in this moment, he realized that he was grateful that he never neglected showing her and telling her how much he loved her. But at the same time, it's like the weight of the fact that he never got to see his mom for the last time. And he just breaks down, you know. And, I mean, just boo-hoo crying. It's, it was heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking. It's one thing for your loved one to die, but for you to not be able to be with them, even though you're right there, um, it was tough. At the same time, we've got Ralph Angel, and he's got a different kind of heaviness on him, right? Like, he's he comes in, he takes his clothes off, he stands there, and he begins to talk to his dad, Papa Bordelon, Ernest Bordelon. And he tells his dad that he misses him. We all miss him. And he tells his dad that he hopes that he's proud of him, right? Because I think Ralph Angel is feeling a lot of pride in himself. A lot of pride in how far he's come. A lot of pride in the fact that he is maintaining and and still progressing. You know what I mean? Still fighting the good fight. And even though he probably gave his dad, we know he gave his dad hell being in and out of jail, um, that he's come full circle, that he's come full circle. He wants his dad to be proud of him. His dad isn't present there to say, I'm proud of you. Okay, so it's the hope and the win, right? At the same time, Hollywood's mom was extremely proud of him and very verbal about it. And up until a few hours earlier, he had that. He had that connection. And like, it's gone. And so Ralph Angel, who has already gone through all of this, is now talking to, um, from his spirit to his father's spirit about loving him and wanting him to be proud of him and missing him. And it brings him to this place where he realizes screw prep and planning, right? I want to marry this woman. He goes in and she's sitting there and he puts his head in the lap, baby. <sighs> oh, mm -mm -mm. These dollar uh, Ralph Angel moments. These dollar Ralph Angel moments are hot. I'm just going to put, if I could just get in my flesh for a minute, these dollar Ralph Angel moments are, are, are very, very steamy. Very, 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 very steamy. Right? And uh, he tells Darla he doesn't want to wait. She's his soulmate, the love of his life. She said, always have been, always will be. He says, I want to marry you. I want to marry you right now. I don't want to wait. And so they get married tomorrow, next episode. I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. So I, 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 I hope I was able to express just, like, how my emotions were playing out through this episode. Like, at first, I was like, what's it all about? This feels forced. It's just a series of compartmentalized boxes and just really unpacking each one and just seeing how much is going on. I don't really understand what's happening with the whole Nova Calvin situation. I'm just not connecting with it. I'm not connecting with this Nova. I'm connecting with Nova outside of Calvin, but the Calvin Nova dynamic, I'm not connecting with it. And I feel like I have valid questions. I really do feel like I have valid questions about how Nova is moving. 
you know, how the Calvin role is being played out. Like he's given us hella ingratiating. I don't know if it's to pander to, to our blackness. I don't know if I'm just being hard on cat. I, I don't get it. Um, the Charlie Micah situation, um, you know, that just that whole, you know, moving funny in this maternal, but, you know, um, in this way where you have to connect with the fact that your son is not your man, right? <laughs> like, I thought that was a good story. Um, and I love how we got some tidbits about what's to come with the whole Parker Landry situation. Um, I think the most in-depth um, scenario scenes box that we saw was the Vi Hollywood Prosper one. Like it was so layered and textured and it there was just so many more far reaching implications there. I don't know if it's because I am a caregiver and daughter of two elderly parents. I don't know if it's because I just love Hollywood and Vi and Prosper so much. Um I don't know. Um and I'm still really, really enjoying Ralph, Angel, and Darla. I, f I do still feel like I'm nervous. And maybe that's a part of the appeal. I'm nervous for them. I am. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm still nervous, right? You guys tell me what y'all think of this episode. Do you get what I'm saying about the boxes? Do you understand what I mean when I say Nova's giving me naive tease? Like, I don't know. You guys are always so good at helping me sort myself through. Um, y'all tell me what you think. Put it down below. And until next time, honeybees. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Ah, 